I think architects fundamentally need to diversify. Business of Architecture, episode 394. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. Today I bring you an incredible conversation, in my opinion, with Adam Scott. Adam Scott is the founder of Free State. Now, Adam Scott is known as, he's an architect, he's a designer, he's the creative force of Free State, as I mentioned, which is a pioneering experience master planning agency. So we're gonna be talking about experience design. Adam has a lot of amazing thoughts. He's an incredible entrepreneur. He's an incredible business person. You'll discover in this episode how he's taken his skills as a designer and applied them not just to the architecture and the built space, but also the entire experience that people experience in an environment. And buckle your seat for this interview. It's gonna be fantastic. Scott has worked with some of the top brands, well-known brands out there. Let me know what you think about this episode. And as always, Carpe DM. here is today's show. Adam, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you very much. You know, nice to be here. Absolutely. So Adam, you, you practice something that you call experience master planning. Yeah, that's right. Which is, yes, it sounds very complicated or even just sort of is made up, which it is made up. It, it, my mother's very confused what I do, but essentially I began as an architect. Now everything I do is to do with, well, it is to do with city making, but also brand building. But the experience piece is always the foundation. It's always the starting point. What is the ideal experience for our end users so we can ultimately make a better end product? That's what we do. And so when in the process do you get involved? Let's say there's a project that's being conceived. When do you like to get into that? Yeah. So ideally, it's, it's as early as possible. So our work, so if I think about what we're doing for Melbourne Airport at the moment, there is a business plan and the airport has strategies coming out of their ears. They have a brand strategy and a state strategy and a tech strategy. But what they don't have is a traveler experience strategy. They don't have anything that starts from the ground up that is sensitive to the needs, enthusiasms, um, you know, wants of their users. So we come in at that beginning point or before there's a project and we then help, I suppose, better direct, create a vision that then can be the foundation to better brief the projects that follow. So, for instance, if there's a big terminal to follow or if there's a whole uh, tech, strat tech sort of tactics to follow around how you better check people in or if there's a whole thing about how you help people to better flow through the airport, it will be based on that piece of work, if that makes sense. And originally you're trained as an architect. How did you make the, the transition from being trained as an architect to going to experience master planning? Um. Well, I went, I did my, so I did my master's at the Royal College of Art. And um, when I was there, I, you know, I enjoyed my architecture, but I really, really enjoyed doing club nights and festivals and live events. That's what I love making. And, you know, to have, be in these extraordinary buildings surrounded by extraordinary characters doing all manner of different art and design practices, but to bring them together. And you knew within moments whether you fucked it up or not, because your audience fundamentally are not there. And if they are there, they don't stay very long. And so that, that I suppose, that love of live and made, made me realize that actually, yes, it's all elements working together. It's not just the architecture and the interiors element, nor is it the lighting and sound, nor is it the digital of how we invite people. It's everything together. It's as much about the DJ as it is about the space. And so that spirit of everything in concert then started to power all our work thereafter, I suppose, if that makes sense. Yeah, so you had, you had this experience, and this happened while you were in your studies of, of putting on these live events and really understanding that it wasn't just the space and the architecture that made these events successful, that there was more to it. How did you then get into turning that into a profession that actually pays the bills? Yeah. Well, I guess that's the thing, isn't it? It's all very well to be kind of messing around doing live events at college, but ultimately people then get a job, don't they? So, well, I was fortunate. I had a really, really bad crit at college. And uh, this character who was one of the guys that was judging the crit, he phoned up the following day and he said, uh, he said Adam, your, your, your tutors have said that it's okay if I get in touch with you. Uh, I'd like you to come around to my studio 
uh, tomorrow and uh, we'd like to talk about your work. And I was thinking, God, this is terrible. I am so, so in need of special treatment. This character from outside the college is, is inviting me in. And off the back of that, he said, I really like the way you tell stories. I like the way you think about narrative and space together. And he was working on the Millennium Dome, which in those days was this sort of extraordinary event space designed by Richard Rogers, where millions and millions of people in London were going to come to celebrate the millennium. And it was going to talk about, you know, important issues of the day and wrap up stuff that was, I suppose, quite generous and entertaining with then elements that were very educational. And so I became an ideas consultant on this project. And pretty much off the back of that, we decided to make up our make our own practice in that way that naively you do when you don't have any idea of business and you just think, yes, I'm going to have a go, even though I don't have any idea how to find yeah how to find clients. And off the back of that, we then started working firstly with MTV and then Virgin Atlantic. So the live stuff with MTV made sense because it was the whole composition. And then with Virgin Atlantic specifically, you know, they were trying to outwit British Airways. It was building that cathedral to aviation in Terminal 5 at Heathrow. And there's no way little Virgin Atlantic with their only 30 planes where, you know, British Airways had over 300, could ever compete. And they can never compete in terms of money, and they can never compete in terms of build it and they will come. So we then had to innovate in all the steps of the journey. So rather than just thinking about the destination, it became about how we sent a car to them, how it was chauffeur driven, how it knew their name. And it said, Enoch, I know your drink. I mix it for you and have it ready in the lounge. How it had people that greeted you at the departure gate and took you all the way through. How it had special drinks, special lighting. Fundamentally, everything coming together to create a great experience. And in many ways, it was those brand projects that were really the launching of Free State, but it really came, you know, from the work we were doing at college, really. Don't know if that makes sense. Huh? You said that when you started out, you were a bit naive about finding clients. How did you go from uh, consulting on the Millennium Dome, which by itself sounds like an amazing, incredible opportunity and commission, mm -hmm. to then getting hired to work with MTV and then subsequently for Virgin Atlantic. How did those opportunities come about? Yeah, well, I suppose in it, 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 a very old fashioned way, really. Uh, and I think uh, that we, we used to, we loved making models. And I suppose one of the best examples is maybe our, our work with Channel 4. So we, we were really interested in the 4 logo and we thought it, we, you know, we thought it had enormous potential that actually it wanted to be a three-dimensional object. It wanted to be a wanted to be a sculpture. We thought, well, wouldn't it be amazing if different artists, particularly emerging artists, could take this four, which would let's say, let's imagine it's like thirty meters high, and then they could wrap it with different stories. It almost became a sort of art platform in its own right. But we knew that there was no way that anybody, uh, you know, Channel 4 would ever speak to us. We certainly didn't know any of them. So we made this beautiful model of this, this four that was nearly as big as their building in London. And we made it as if it was made by some crazy sort of shepherd. And it was made of bales and it had goats and sheep all over it. And then a shepherd in front of it. And then we wrapped it up in a beautiful box and we delivered it to the front of Channel 4, saying to the head of marketing, there was a lovely man who we then went on to a friend called Rufus saying, you know, we'd love to talk to you. We've got a wonderful idea. And he was so blown away by this gift, by this act of generosity, that he gave us a meeting and then commissioned a feasibility study. And now we're 12 years into that project and we've been building different big fours for them ever since. But it was a moment of generosity. That's how it began. And we did that a lot. That was our way of opening doors. Yeah. Fantastic. And so was, was, was that station the station that got you the opportunity with MTV or did I miss here, uh, did I miss here on, on the actual client that you said that first it was the Millennium Dome, second client was? Yeah, so second it was MTV and, and that was, MTV. again, gotcha. it, was, it was having an idea, um, sending it, which in many ways I wouldn't recommend to anybody these days because I think, you know, it, it, it was incredibly labor intensive but i suppose what i would recommend which is still what we do is rather than targeting businesses we would target individuals 
So when we first, for instance, yeah, the MTV thing, we knew there was a new guy there called James Scroggs, who was the head of marketing. We knew that he was interested in architecture and sort of physicality and making the band real. And we knew that he was known to be a bit of a pioneering soul who would commission things from the outside, that he wouldn't go for the normal tried and tested agency model. He was up for adventures. And so we targeted James and got a meeting with him. And, and, and ever since, that's what we've done. We've always targeted individuals rather than businesses. And how did you find out this information about James that goes above and beyond the job title, but actually things like he was up for an adventure, things like he was looking to go a different route than the traditional agency route? How did you get that yeah. intel, shall we say? Well, we were, we were making sure that we were reading, so reading a lot of magazines that we knew that the clients would read. And I think often maybe where maybe particularly architects get wrong, I think, but it's the same as any industry. They, they get lost in, you know, architects speaking to architects or if you're, you know, if you're a spoon designer, you know, Spoon Weekly is all spoon designers read. And we were going, no, let's read Marketing Week. Let's read Campaign. Let's find out who's new to their jobs because we are fascinated by the bridge between architecture and branding. We, we knew that, you know, within our world, I suppose, you know, fundamentally being in your early 20s, we didn't think we'd get architecture work. And we fundamentally thought actually that that felt very slow. And, you know, we weren't going to, and yet our friends who are in advertising were already getting really interesting projects and were loved because they were young and enthusiastic, which seems to be the opposite of the architecture profession. So we thought, let's kind of fuse these things together and look at the overlaps between the brand and the, you know, the physicality, I suppose. Mm. Fascinating. And that project went well for you and you were able to roll that into an opportunity with Virgin Atlantic. Well, that's right. I mean, all of those things... Uh, I think Virgin, they saw our work at, at Channel 4. They saw the big sculptures there and found that very interesting. So they then started talking to us because the Virgin, the, the Channel 4 stuff was known for its program. It wasn't about the sculpture. It was the fact that every few months there would be an open competition where different you know, emerging artists and designers would then make it their own. And I think that programmatic way of working, almost thinking about the built environment as if it's a campaign, that it's constantly there involving people, really made sense to the Virgin Atlantic people who were interested in drawing in their audience. So in many ways, you know, everything we've always done is about the opposite and build, if build it and they might come. It's involve me and I will come again and again and again. That's our mantra. And I think Virgin that connected with them, I feel. Explain to me this idea that you just shared about the uh, the competition, the way it worked at the MTV. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I caught yeah. what was happening there in terms of involving other people. Can you explain that to me, Adam? So the well, that was the, so the Channel Four project was it was there is still outside um, Channel 4's building on Horseberry Road, uh, you know, in, in central London, there is a huge four, which is extruded. It kind of is a strange shape. And only from one angle does it make a four. And from all others, it's, you know, it, it's a lovely visual illusion. And it's about 24 metres high, and it weighs nine and a half uh, tonnes. And it sits there on this concrete uh, sort of piazza with a lecture theatre underneath it. Anyway. The way the competition works is that we well we'd have a whole range of them. One of them was to to students that had just left college, and so we sent it out to twenty different colleges, and we said, you know, we're interested in people who have just graduated, and we gave them a brief. So I think that brief was one about I think it was about breathing, or um, and and so the idea of you know how can this thing have a life. And so, um, or there was another one, maybe a better example, uh, which was about uh, reuse, about, 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 about uh, recycling. And so lots and lots of different students put in their work, all made different little models, a bit like we had done two years before. And then we had uh, some wonderful uh, characters. You know, one was from the Tate and one was from a white cube gallery who came in and judged it for us. So that was all great marketing for Channel 4. And then this wonderful lady, Canadian lady called Stephanie. Stephanie Imbu, 
Uh, she had an idea that was about uh, taking all of the umbrellas that had been lost that year on London Underground and covering the four in hundreds and hundreds of umbrellas, all open, all multicolored. So it looked like a huge sort of, uh, you know, uh, installation of flowers. And, um, you know, people loved it. It was on the front page of the Standard. There, there were tourist buses that were rerouted to go past it. And that was great for Channel 4, great storytelling for them. And then that helped build momentum for six months later, having another competition. That's how it worked. Thank you for the explanation. Virgin Atlantic, what did that project look like? And how did it, what was the experience there that you were creating? Tell me, tell me what you rolled out there. So um, what was critical for Virgin, I think, is that, and I think a lot of our work is like this, that... Um, you start with the individual and you make sure that you have, you know, you spend a proper amount of research understanding, you know, what the psychographic information. So their enthusiasms, their motivations, their needs. And it was particularly the, um, uh, the, the Virgin's, uh, what's it called, uh, premium service, so what, upper class. And so high net worth characters, how could they better attract these souls to Virgin Atlantic, which was seen in, in those days as something that was a, a bit of an upstart and not nearly as kind of solid and old school as British Airways, which, you know, they turned to their advantage, but at that time wasn't clear. So we did lots and lots of research, lots of uh, workshops, uh, gathered lots of data around that particular audience and found that it was clear that it was time that they were most worried about, that actually, no matter how extraordinary the experience in the lounge or the, I don't know, the architectural glamour of the kind of interiors or whatever it might be. Actually, it was time. If we could save them time, that was their most valuable asset. And so rather than looking at just the design of, well, I suppose the lounge, the destination bit, which on the whole, most designers, the most, you know, aviation brands have been focusing on, we stretched it and started to think, well, what if it was about, you know, from the garden gate to the departure gate? What if you were actually sending people, you know, a chauffeur-driven car that picks them up at their garden gate, saves them an hour and a half. All of a sudden, it's like Enoch's in the back of the car. He's feeling relaxed. He's kind of, you know, we've checked in his bags. He knows because the driver has phoned ahead that he's going to be 40 minutes away. They're waiting for him. And then from there, driving up through this James Bond baddies ramp, with this wonderful light show that then celebrated your moment of entry. There was a sculpture in the centre that beautifully uh, sort of moiréed as you came in with a show of lights. And then one of the staff steps into a point of light, steps forward from behind the desk, welcomes you. So fundamentally what we're enjoying here is all of these elements, you know, the hardware of the interiors and the architecture, the software of the programming of lights and the... Uh, you know, the programming of how that sort of the team step forward and the human wear of how we rehearse those people, how they have the right words to say to better greet you. So it's all these elements working together. And fundamentally, that way of thinking followed through the whole experience from arrival onwards. And that that's, yeah, that's how we looked at it. And that's fantastic. And Adam, when you, when you create these experiences, master plan these experiences, is this the, the sole product of, of Adam Scott's mind, or do you bring in collaborators to help you pull this off? Yeah, no, it's, it's, only, it, it, it's only as good as the collaborators. And I know that's an easy thing to say, but you know, really, you shouldn't be having a conversation with me. We should have a whole kind of rogues gallery of hundreds of souls around me. Because, I mean, the work we then went on to do, which I think is, is, you know, really demonstrates that, is after those sort of, um, you know, Virgin projects and, 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 and Channel 4 projects, we then started working with Sony and Samsung. And it was particularly Sony where we were doing these gigantic shows. I mean, you know, some of your audience will know about CES in Las Vegas, which is the world's biggest consumer electronics show, where these mega brands will spend millions and millions of dollars over just four days 
to attract and involve the right audience. And that's where they'll launch their new products and services. And it's absolutely critical to their business that that gigantic market stall kind of works beautifully and, and fundamentally attracts and involves the right audience. So with that work, you know, we won a project, the, the biggest project that Sony had, which was their relaunch. It was called um, An Experience Like No Other. And we won it kind of out of the blue, really. We didn't really deserve to win it. And to be honest, I'd never been to a trade show. So, I, I, you know, we were some ways the last people to ever win it. But to answer your question, the reason we won it was because of all these wonderful people. There was a guy called Morris Leider who had been Pink Floyd's producer. And he'd also been the you know, Pink Floyd tour manager and then he'd been the producer for the Sydney Olympics. So he was our kind of you know producer. Or we had Mark Brickman, who was the lighting designer for Cirque du Soleil. So in that same way that we'd sort of generously found our way to Channel 4, we were doing the same with the team. We were phoning people up and saying, you're a legend. I love what you do with you too. I Can I have a conversation? I've got a possible thing that you might be interested in. And because we were tiny and, and you know, really enthusiastic about meeting interesting souls, we started building that kind of group around us, people far better than us, ultimately. So that's, yeah. That's. <laughs> Tell me about that. Tell me about your, your perspective on, on partnering and collaboration because I, I think it's apparent. When I look at your website, Adam, I can see that you have, you have collaborators on there. And it seems like you have, uh, as you mentioned, pulling off big things is difficult. It's not, no, no person is an island. And you mentioned that there would be hundreds of people behind you to help pull this off. How, yeah. how do you approach partnerships and collaboration just from a mental mindset to be able to pull together these teams because let's face it these people are busy they have other opportunities there's a bit of salesmanship a bit of marketing that goes into even engaging them in the vision and in the idea yeah i think that's right and i think you know i mean i think we learn a lot actually not from our friends who are architects but particularly friends who are I think in the film business is a good example of that. Where you know there'll be a director and a writer who who won't have anything apart from the beginning of an idea, and then you know kind of slightly making it up and buying a lot of lunches and having a lot of drinks, you start to kind of rally interest, and slowly it begins. And for us, in some ways, it's very similar that we start with the story. We make sure that that story is really, you know, it's really powerful, not just powerful because it will attract the client or it will attract our audience, but also beautifully told so it will begin to draw in the team. Because fundamentally, the team is interested in the story. They are rallying around that. They, 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 it's not so much Free State or Adam. It is whether they believe in that story. And I think that's probably critical to how we draw them in. I think the other thing is also that we are, I hope, very, you know, very candid and very, uh, you know, very honest with people. So we're sort of, you know, saying, you know, we talk about money right from the very beginning. We talk about time. We talk about responsibility. Uh, you know, we're also, because we have a lot of freelancers that work with us, we're talking to them months and months in advance. We're giving them a bit of space to think about, you know, are they going to do the Free State Project or the other project? And so we're really caring, doing it on their terms because it is an endeavor of fellowship. It is not us just, you know, we don't have the main power because we have the money. Actually, it's their time that's most valuable. And so we start with respect for that. And I think everything follows. So that's sort of how we do it. Now, talk to me about the, the money conversation that you have up front, which I think is, is very, very powerful. I can imagine, now correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine with an endeavor like this, it'd be very difficult to pin down the scope of what is going to happen. It's a creative work. It's a creative effort. It's something that, how, how would you have, how do you have that money conversation? I'm imagining that at the beginning, you don't even know what you're going to create yet. You may have a story, you may have an idea of the pieces you'll pull together, or do you know what you're going to create? How do you have that conversation around money when you may not yeah. be sure what you're doing? That's true. So, and I think, I mean, critically, I suppose the the story bit, the reason I tell you that bit is that there'll be the beginnings in the same way that, you know, when when Walt Disney 
did that his first storyboards for Snow White, there were just five cells to kind of begin to tell this story. And so we're, you know, we start with something that's very humble like that. And we're fundamentally saying we, we want you to get involved to help us solve this. And then we can look at similar projects. And because we have a very clear process, our process from investigation to vision to creation to activation, whether it's a small project or a gigantic project, it always follows that rhythm. So, you know, we can say, right, within this investigation piece, you know, we know that, you know, we have this many weeks. We know that this is the kind of audience we're beginning to look at. And we know that we need a team of ethnographers and researchers and strategists. And so we, we you know, we, we, we're very, we begin to then steward them into that space because we know that that works. And then we quietly then move on to the vision bit, which will then be hand in hand between the strategists and the designers. And so it's a very, it's a mutant endeavor made of many, many moving parts, but within a very tried and tested process. And actually that process hasn't changed much really in 20 years, even though we can I can tell it a bit better now. It's not that dissimilar, really. And how long have you been doing this? You mentioned 20 years. You've been doing this for 20 years. To give us a, an idea of the time frame. Well, the Millennium Dome was uh, when we were at college. We finished college in 1999, and the Millennium Dome opened in January the 1st, 2000. Um, we, we've never worked for anyone else, which is a good and bad thing because it means that we're also fantastically naive, I feel. You know, there's so much I learned from people who have had you know, work with really amazing other companies. But yeah, that's, that's, that's the 20 years. And in many ways, the first, uh, oof, you know, until 2015, I suppose, it was pretty much the world of brand experiences. And, you know, I think in many ways, you know, we, you know, it didn't have that name when we began, but it's definitely, you know, a lot of our work's become known as, you know, this, this sort of, you know, these exemplar brand experiences but now we do work with city makers with property developers and it's more of a city making place making world and so that's been maybe the last six seven years has been where that transition's gone i suppose back to architecture <laughs> how does how do you how do you apply this idea this powerful idea of experience master planning you help us understand how this is actually uh, manifested in the built environment you talked about over the past seven years you've gone actually back to architecture yeah. can you give us some yeah. examples of projects in that space and how you approach that yes and, and i should tell you why it's useful too because I, I mean obviously that's what we're getting at here because i think you know one of i suppose fundamentally i think that the way the built environment is commissioned is is all wrong i i think on the whole developers begin with a conversation with some gut feelings and very, very little information, and very, very little understanding about their audience. And what they get from their consultants on the whole is what is, so what is selling now? It's what's not, they're not talking about what is selling next. There's no way that Apple or Airbnb would develop a product or a service without deeply understanding their audience and what they want next. And so we begin there and then we start to think about all of the things that are going to be appropriate to attract and involve that audience. Where I think the built environment goes wrong is it doesn't firstly begin with enough of that evidence. And then secondly, and with all due respect to your audience, it goes straight to architects who have a vested interest in selling buildings. You know, it's that thing of, you know, if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail where they're going to go, of course, I shall take your money and I'll build you a thing. But that thing may well work. It may well not. Because so much of the way the, you know, the process works is there's not allowed to be enough research because everybody's got to quickly pick up their pens and move quickly to thinking about the physical master plan what, rather than putting in that research. So I suppose to answer your question, our work gives more surety around whether this will connect with your audience and it allows you bet to better optimize the budget and resources you have at your command because you might say, actually, I can see that a lot of what I need to do will be digital or will be around technology or will be around platforms. And then from then onwards, <laughs> my child is here, one of my children has just given me that. 
which is going to be incredibly difficult for me to do an interview with. So I think put it in the fridge. Um, (laughs) Fantastic. For those who are listening, it was a beautiful ice cream cone with a bit of chocolate in it, it appeared. (laughs) Right. Let's return to it. So fundamentally, then our work then helps you optimize all of your resources thereafter. And I think, you know, in that sense, you know, our work is then ever so useful, not just for day one, but day 10,001. We're interested in how you better operate this campus. We do a lot of campus projects, university campuses, commercial campuses. And it means that you're not just getting a great design for day one, you're getting something that a sort of system, if you like, that will constantly draw in your audience. And that, I think, is why it's so valuable, I would say. Adam, what would you say is your creative process? How do you, how do you have the time to, to actually think of creative and innovative solutions, or do they just come to you? Well, I think, I think it's that thing about the research that, you know, I mean, I, I fear that, you know, human-centered design and those clever Kelly brothers have rather sort of stolen the thunder from the architecture profession, where actually, in many ways, the business of architecture was always, I think, particularly at college level, brilliant at understanding and caring, you know, the idea of direct action, you know, your eyes on the street, and then you grow ideas from there, but not just ideas in terms of meeting an opportunity, you know, meeting a challenge with an opportunity, but actually allowing you to leap ahead. And so I would say that our process, yes, is grounded on, you know, that kind of rigor and learning from our favorite ethnographers but, and, and big data and rich data. But then I suppose the creative leaps often come from our work in other sectors that actually I think, you know, our work that we're doing with the education campuses at the moment is far better because of the work we're doing in airports. Because, you know, airports are the world's greatest, in some ways, live laboratories. You know, there is a, you know, an ecosystem constantly in flux, constantly changing, with data coming out of their ears, and is a fantastic way to get your head around how you can attract and involve audiences. In the same way that maybe our rock and roll stuff, again, helps you think about how public spaces can be better catalysts for, I know, social interaction, in a way that if we spent all our time just looking at public spaces i think we design some nice benches but fundamentally i don't think we draw in an audience and so it is that richness i suppose that is critical to our creative process but based on the human-centered experience centered rigor the two Mm. together Mm. what would you tell architects what is what is the secret to staying relevant how do you see this how do you see that architects can continue to stay relevant, or if they're even beginning to decline, how they can increase their relevance and become placemakers and have a bigger impact. Oh, I I, I, I think architects are so, you know, it's such a wonderful training. And I think that commitment to how you connect, you know, people with their cities, with their environments, you know, it couldn't be more important, particularly now with this certainly uncertain future where, you know, there is no doubt, you know, all of our clients will want more with less, you know, how are we going to draw in a, you know, an atomized groups of people who this sort of societal psychosis that has pushed us apart and how are we going to bring people back together again? And I think fundamentally, to answer your question, I think architects are wonderfully placed to do that, but I think only if they're prepared to look at all channels together. So rather than, you know, that sort of, if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail way of doing it. I think what they've got to do is be much more, I heard it described the other day as rather than deja vu, where a designer looks at a question, a problem and goes, ah, I've seen that before. You know, I, I, I recognize that. You need to, you need to be, be um, channeling vu jade. You need to be looking at it and saying, I've never seen this before. This is completely unique. And then as a result, I'm going to take all the channels at my command in the way that architects, you know, can design at so many different levels. We need them then to think particularly what might be the small, ephemeral, peripatetic 
pop-up active thing that's the answer. And that will then draw in clients to bigger and bigger projects. You know, I think we need to actually take meanwhile use and things that are much lighter on their feet far more seriously, because I think that will actually give us the clues. That's almost the rehearsal to how we might build more permanently. So fundamentally, I think our audience, our architects, need to get more into things that are lighter, more fast-moving, more flexible. And then I think we're all going to be ever so useful in this more uncertain future. And how do you see architecture and the built environment changing, the industry changing over the next 10 years? Well, I think, I mean, there is a dark view of this, of course. You know, professional services at every level have been, you know, increasingly being aggressed from all sides. Um, I think architects fundamentally need to diversify. I think, you know, when, I mean, for instance, a good example of this is, let's say, Snow Hetter in Norway, where they, you know, yes, there are, yes, there are buildings, yes, there are master plans, yes, there are brand strategies and campaigns. There is also graphic design and products. You know, there is a wealth of, 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 of work there, which isn't, isn't actually that they are, I think it's all co- it comes from a single root, that there is a rigor there, and then they're more comfortable with actually what that might mean for a number of different outputs. So I find that very impressive. I also think that I, I would like to see, I would like to see architecture, I suppose, you know, that thing that I was talking about of involve me and I will come. I'd like architectures to be more involved in the constant measurement, the constant evaluation, so that actually we can prove that our audience, our users care deeply about this. So the whole post-occupancy evaluation and the interest not just in day one, but day two and beyond, I think actually is a great opportunity for architecture. But of course, we've got to engage with data there. And I think there needs to be more more, more richness of conversation going on there, I'd say. Uh, Adam, how do, how do our listeners find out more about your work? Where should they go? Well, we have we have a very out of date website that I'm always a bit embarrassed by, and it's all very well me telling you know brands all over the world how to communicate, but I never seem to quite have the time to get get our one going. Although we are relaunching it in six weeks, so there are things about the website that I think there's good stuff there. I mean, I'm always keen for people to get in touch and tell us you know what they're interested in what, what what they're up to that's very important um there's also you know a number of films and things that can be found there and also you know whether you're i don't know looking at going around a, a google campus soon or a melbourne airport or um or walking through regent street soon you will yeah you will be within our work but actually going back to that thing you said about collaboration in many ways, our work is really quiet. You know, people don't necessarily know, even though I'm a, a bit of an evangelist, clearly. Actually, you know, our work is, you know, belongs to its audience. So you won't actually see our name on any of those things. But, um, yeah, we're there. <laughs> mm, fantastic. Well, Adam, thank you for joining us here on the Business of Architecture podcast. You're very welcome. You know, thank you for inviting me, sir. It's been a delight. And that is a wrap. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practice Business of Architecture step-by-step executive training program for firm owners who want a practice that gives them freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Because you see, likely it isn't your skill as an architect or your skill as a designer that holds you back in architecture. It's everything else related to running a business redoing staff work, trying to find the right people, keeping the right people, and keeping the money flowing so it all runs smoothly. If you're ready to stop reinventing the wheel, get a proven system, and simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash training to discover a free video where you'll discover the smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of your architecture. As a reminder, The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.